So let's get started. I'm Vivian New, the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society, and uh, wanted to welcome everybody who's joining us tonight. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Art chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Ama Mutsun tribal band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone. This is land that was theirs for thousands of years and it was taken forcibly from them. Despite two centuries of oppression and genocide, they still live and thrive in this area today. We acknowledge and respect them for their land stewardship and their culture, language, and humanity. Our chapter hopes to learn from them and hopes to support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. And first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to the talk. Um, if it, this is the first time you've been to one of our talks, we would really love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you don't mind, um, please type that into the chat, whether you're on YouTube or um, with us directly on Zoom. And uh, we have a team. It's not just me and Brooke and Ben. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Gladys Mercier, who is our YouTube moderator. So for those of you who are joining us on YouTube, Gladys is monitoring the chat there. So you can communicate with us and she will make sure that all the information gets brought over here to Zoom. Our QA moderator for the evening is Judy Fennerty and she is the person who's gonna be asking questions um, of our speakers that you guys can type into chat. And we have two speakers tonight. We have Brooke Constance, who is a recipient of one of our chapter scholarships and uh, our featured speaker, Ben Carter. If you are not familiar with CNPS, um, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965 and we currently have over 10,000 members. We have chapters all over the state and even outside the country in Baja, California. Um, we, our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter and we are cover all of Santa Clara County as well as Southern San Mateo. Um, our mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats, and we do that through science, education, conservation, and gardening. If you are not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. Um, in addition to supporting all the work that we do, you get some great benefits. There are two journals that you would receive, Artemisia, which is a scientific journal, and Flora, which has lots of general interest general interest articles about native plants. You'd also receive our Blazing Star chapter newsletter, which gives you information about all our events, as well as interesting articles about local uh, topics. You also get discounts on participating local nurseries. So it's very simple to join. All you have to do is go to cnps.org join, and you can sign up online. Uh, we our chapter supports itself largely through sales from our nursery. Um, you can order online now. During the summer, which is where we are right now, um, we are only accepting larger orders for trying to help out those of you who are doing um, lawn conversions or some other large landscaping project. Um, we'll reopen uh, for pickup sales in August at some point. Um, so you can stay tuned um, by going to the nursery site or our chapter website. And um, you can look at see what we have if you don't have a large order and, and then place your order in August. We have a lot of great events coming up. Um, next Friday is our photography group show and tell. So if you like looking at pretty pictures of plants or if you are a photographer and would like to share plants, that is a meeting that is open to all. Um, you can find out more about how to participate uh, by going to our website, cnps-scv.org. We have a lot of talks coming up. So the first one in August is going to be on container gardening with native plants by Pete Villeux of East Bay Wilds. 
Um, we will have a virtual garden tour the week following that. And I see I have the dates wrong on here. I apologize for that. Um, the correct dates will be on our website. Um, and that is a garden tour of the Salinger Garden, which is an absolutely fabulous garden um, in, up in uh, the north part of the peninsula. Um, we have an in-person field trip coming up at the beginning of August as well. This field trip is only for CNPS members. So if you are not currently a member, this would be a good reason to join. Um, it's gonna be at Tilden Regional Park, uh, which is a fabulous botanic garden featuring native plants. If you haven't been there, I strongly urge you to go even if you don't join us on the field trip. And that field trip will be led by Bart O'Brien, who is a former chapter president and also the director of the T Tilden Regional Par Park Botanic Garden. Um, you can find out more about that because you do have to sign up ahead of time on our website. Um, so you just go to cnps-scv.org and go to our field trip page and the sign up link will be there. And then we will be finishing out August with another talk on and it will be on paintbrushes in peril uh, by Mark Ager, who is one of a who is an expert on Castilea. Um, so that should be a great talk. If um, you want to keep up with all of our events, uh, you can either do that by visiting our website, cnps-scv.org. We also post everything on Meetup, and we announce our um, upcoming events weekly on our chapter news mailing list. So if you are not on that mailing list, I highly recommend it. It's only one message a week, and that will give you the latest and greatest um, information about what's coming up. Very easy to join. You just send an email to this very long um, address that's on the, the slide, or you can go to our website and the information is right there and you, it's clickable there. And we're always looking for help. So if you are enjoying these virtual events and you like um, helping out with Zoom or uh, YouTube, all you have to do is be able to use a keyboard, a mouse, know how to switch windows, copy and paste, and uh, you could help out. So if being a QA moderator or the YouTube moderator sounds like something that might be of interest, please get in touch with us. Um, you can just send an email to Madeline Morrow at earthlink.net. Her contact information is also on our website, uh, and we would really love to have you join our team. So before we get into the talks, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if your microphone is not currently muted, please mute it. Um, you are welcome to ask questions at any time, but you do that in the chat, not vocally. So as I mentioned before, we have people monitoring chat on both YouTube and on Zoom. And when the speakers are done talking, um, Judy will be asking all those questions from chat. Um, and now I am ready to introduce our first speaker, who is Brooke Constance. He is a PhD candidate at UC Santa Cruz right now. He graduated um, from Davis in 2011, and he has done habitat restoration for Audubon. Um, and then after doing that, he went to Chico, where he got a master's in tropical forestry. And then he went out and uh, started a sustainable farm. He's also done environmental consulting, um, both rare plant and bird surveys. And um, he specializes in floodplains and riparian habitat, and that's what he's going to be talking about tonight. So go ahead, Brooke. Welcome and congratulations. We are very pleased to have you as one of our scholarship awards. Thank you, Vivian. So I'm gonna start my screen share. Awesome. Can everyone see that okay? Looks good. Great. So uh, my name is Brooke Constance. I am a second year going on third year PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, and I was a recipient of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter Scholarship, which helps support this research that I'm going to talk about. So this was my first full se field season that I did with this um, with the support the year before I did a little bit of research, but it was a COVID year. So I wasn't able to get authorization until uh, after the first heat spell. So the understory was a little bit dry, but during this field season, I collected vegetation data for my dissertation research uh, during the main flowering period um, along the Sacramento river, which is between mid-March and mid-June. 
And during this talk, I'm going to briefly go over some of the methods I did. I'll have a lot of pictures and some preliminary results. I haven't done as deep of a dive as I'd want yet, but I have uh, started going into the data, um, the vegetation data I collected this year. So just as a really quick uh, summary, uh, back in the 1980s, as a response to about 95% of the California riparian habitat being removed, the state Senate passed SB 1086, which was to address forest loss by restoring habitat and then learning from that restoration and improving it over the future. Um, so as a response to that, there were about four surveys conducted, two of them in the understory and two of them in the overstory. And I'm really what my work is, is, is building off those surveys and getting a chronology or getting a change over time for both the overstory and understory and understanding how these restored sites are doing relative to remnant sites over time and if they're converging or becoming more similar to them. So as far as um, kind of a map of where I am to give you context. So this is the upper middle reach of the Sacramento River. So it runs from about Red Bluff to Calusa where a lot of this habitat registration is done, but my work is focused between Princeton and Red Bluff, which is about um, 60 miles or 100 kilometers. And the reason why it's focused in that area is I need restored sites and remnant forests, which are forests that were never, um, which were stored or naturally, they naturally recruited, they weren't restored by humans. Um, I need them to be next to each other because there's so many abiotic factors like um, uh, soil and water level and, and flood action that could change the vegetation communities. So when they're next to each other, it, it minimizes those sort of spatial differences that you would see as they uh, get further away. So what's really fun about this project is a lot of these restored forests are starting to become 31 years old, which is, which is middle-aged for a riparian forests. So you should start seeing this change from early secessional species like willows to more mid-secessional ones like cottonwoods and uh, box elders. So this is a really good point in time to collect more data and see if these restored forests are following these sort of similar changes in at least tree patterns that you would expect that you have that you do see in naturally recruiting forests. So as far as my survey method, there were three different components um, and they were all done in these 20 by 30 meter plots. And so in each of these plots, I would do 10 one by one meter quadrats that looked at the understory and they would look at percent cover. Um, I would do five 10 meter shrub transects that would look at shrub cover. And then I would measure all the trees above uh, two and a half centimeters, which is a little bit larger than an inch um, at diameter of breast height. And if they had more than um, three stems, I would just take the three largest ones. And the questions I, were ask I was asking were around plant composition and how that's been changing over time as well as basal area. So that's the, the area of wood for each tree species and how that's changed over time. And a lot of this research I'll be talking about is, is what I found from this year. Um, I'm still planning on looking at previous years um, as, as time goes on. So as far as results, and I wanna show you this picture on the left because this is a uh, Copta, which is one of the more Northern restored sites. Um, a lot of the Himalayan blackberry was <laughs> kind of invaded a lot of the sites and, and it was really common. It was, it was a big part of doing surveys out there was cutting through the blackberry and, and trekking through it and, and doing transects. Um, and it was a, a little bit surprising um, how intensive it was to get through. Um, but I still got through it and I was able to collect, um, it was a dry year, but I got about 75 understory species, which is a little bit low for that area where you'd expect about 100 to 110. Um, but I completed about almost half of my sites that I wanted to do. I wanted to pair um, 36 restored and 36 remnant. And during that, I, I did all the surveys I wanted to do. I, I did trees and I did understory. So I did 343 quadrats. I did 165 sh um, shrub transex lines and I, did, uh, I collected 859 trees. Um, so this year was really nice because I was calibrating my methods. I was trying out kind of different methods to collect different types of uh, uh, vegetation and seeing how they worked and, and getting feedback. And, and, and I will use this data. Um, for publications, but it was really good as a kind of a calibration to next year to come in even stronger. Um, and I was able to get a lot done for my form standardization and my methods. So by the end of the season, uh, things got really, really fast. I was about twice as fast at collecting um, vegetation data at the end of the eight weeks as I was from the beginning. So I, I made some figures to show the different, um, <laughs> the different stratas and the types of patterns I was noticing in vegetation. So uh, one of the most common things, if you look at all the understory cover is Bromus diandris was very dominant, um, followed by Rubus armaniacus and then um, Carex barbari and Gallium aparine were the, the most dominant understory species that you found. And I created this um, 
this plot, which is a non metric dimensional scaling, which basically I took the 20 most common species and I compared restored and remnant sites. So the blue is all the restored sites and the green are all the remnant sites. And then you plotted all the different species on this kind of two dimensional graph to intuitively visualize how the species composition is different. Um, and then you draw these ellipses and these ellipses have about two thirds of the data in them. So there's a little bit of overlap between them. So it says that they're not that different, but if you look at the restored sites, there is more, you know, California rose, there's more Himalayan blackberry, there's more box elder. So it's more woody that, uh, of an understory than the remnant sites, which is more um, kind of uh, Bromus diandris, Gallian aparine, um, Vitus californica, um, um, kind of Elemis trichocoides. So you have more of a um, native and non-native, but um, grass and, and, and forbs. In, in the um, remnant understory. Uh, if you look at the shrub species, um, Rubus armeniacus was very dominant, <laughs> um, followed by uh, Aristolochia californica, which is quite fine, um, and a little bit of Rubus ursinus, which is the California blackberry. And there's a lot of overlap between the, um, the restored in blue and the remnant in green. Um, and they're very similar shrubs, which I didn't quite expect based on the differences in understory. Um, but it was kind of interesting to see how the, the blackberry is very dominant in both of them uh, and piece that together. Um, for the overstory trees, uh, just by ranking, um, I did basal area, which is where you, you get all the stems and then you use the diameter of site to convert it into an area. So you divide the diameter by two and then you uh, do pi r squared and you get an area and then you find out you know, by area of wood, which species are the most dominant. And that gives you a lot of information about what's um, successional stage um, that habitat is. Is it early successional, mid, or is it late successional for that forest? Um, and Populus fremonti was very, very dominant in both the forests. But if you look at the restored forest in blue, it's a lot more early successional. There's a lot, there's like Salix lepis, which is a royal willow, you have Platinus ramosa, um, yeah. And you have like Fraxinus latifolia, Oregon ash. So you have a lot of these like early successional species that are pretty dominant um, in the composition of the uh, restored forest. But if you go into the remnant, you get things like um, Juglis and Insai, Acer nagundo um, are a little bit more common. So more of these like mid successional. So you don't quite see the same composition as far as basal area, uh, which um, still suggests that they haven't quite converged. They're not quite similar, even though these some of these restored forests are getting to middle age, so it could just take more time um, for them to resemble each other. But a lot of this could also come from the fact that restored forests are planted with a variety of different species. They'll plant oaks, they'll, which are late secessional. They'll plant, you know, mid-secessional cottonwoods and early secessional uh, willows because there's so much uh, variation with the soils and the hydrology that you really want to hedge your bets and plant a, a bunch of different species, even within um, one sort of alliance like mixed riparian or, or oak woodland, so that they're um, Kind of that is a legacy of, of how things were planted, especially earlier on in this restoration. Um, and it could still take more time to um, converge and look like a remnant forest. So as far as um, lessons learned, because this was my first field season, which is very much a learning opportunity, and I still have three more years in my program, um, I learned that um, GPSs are very hard to use in a forest because the trees and the leaves block a lot of the radio signal. So initially I wanted to get a stem map, which is for every tree that you collect the diameter of, you also get its position. And you can get interesting information about how the trees are clustering, which uh, could help you ask questions about it. Are the rows that the rest restored trees planted in still very relevant? Are they changing over time? But the accuracy was so low that I had to shift, which is you know part of science, you're always adapting. Um, and uh, another thing that really surprised me is the amount of time it takes to get to sites. Um, and it is a learning curve, like learning how to use a machete quickly um, and where to climb and how to find paths, which things like deer are very good at, but humans doesn't, isn't necessarily intuitive at first. But um, I learned a lot and I have a really good sense of next year when I go out and just do understory um, and get all the sites done, how to do it more quickly. So I have a really good process and flow that should be really efficient next time. So in conclusion, um, from my preliminary data, there's still a lot more data analysis I can do with it. The overstory composition was quite different between the uh, restored and remnant, where the restored very much resembled like an early secessional forest, as opposed to the remnant, which resembled a kind of a middle-aged secessional forest. Um, the understories between the two forests were somewhat different, but not completely. Um, and the shrubs between restored and remnant forests were, uh, were very similar. 
So uh, next year, uh, we'll hopefully will not be an additional dry, it won't be another dry year. So when I go back and survey, I'm hoping to get a higher species diversity and something um, a little bit more representative of a normal year because the dryness definitely contributed to um, a little bit lower species diversity than I otherwise would expect. But still, it's very nice to have this data from a dry year to get to better characterize the range of um, um, kind of floristics that you would see in these forests. So, um, and then really quickly as acknowledgements, I'd like to thank the California Native Plant Society for funding this, as well as the Langham Fellowship, the Northern California Botanist, my field assistant, James Armis, and uh, Yulin Song, which helped me create those plots. So, thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Brooke. That was terrific and looks like a very promising study topic. So uh, we had a couple of questions is about the restored sites. Uh, is there anything removed before the sites are restored? Why is there so much him, uh, Armenian blackberry in the restored areas? Is on, I guess my question would be to add on to that is, uh, are some of these sites under ongoing management or have were restored and then left as is? Um, so a lot of the properties were, they were initially in nut orchards and they were converted. So all the trees were ripped out and then they were kind of prepped much like a, um, with disking and earth moving and they were planted kind of like an orchard and they were sprayed for the first three years. Um, and then as long as they didn't fail for the most part, they would be left alone um, except for understory management. So a lot of these lands were handed off to the refuge, which would do controlled burns. They would do mowing for fire risk. So the, and there, there was a lot of grazing. So the understory to some degree was, was managed, but the overstory was largely uh, left alone. Great. So uh, we have a question from Ben Carter saying that it might be, or a comment, might be interesting to overlay dispersal traits. Uh, for example, bird dispersed versus wind for those woody plants. That might explain some of those successional differences and very cool work. Thank you. Um, that's a good idea. I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Oh, you can always add more, you can always add more uh, research topics to any. Yeah, once you have the data. <laughs> yeah. That's the hard part. And then, yeah, it's analysis goes fairly quick. Right. Okay. Um, I don't think we have anything else. Uh, Vivian, do you see anything else or Gladys? Okay. No, just comments. I Excellent presentation. It's great. Well, thanks very much. And we look forward to, um, to seeing your present, you know, what happens in the future and your research work. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. That was great. And um, now we're going to have our featured speaker, Ben Carter. And Ben is an associate professor of biology and the director of the Carl Schar Smith Herbarium at San Jose State University. His current research focuses on the biogeography of bryophytes, and bryophytes are mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. And just as a side note, did you know that CNPS has a chapter dedicated to bryophytes, and Ben is uh, one of the, the leads of that chapter. Um, he is in also involved in the conservation of rare plants and he studies the evolution and ecology of flower color. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Ben. I'm excited to hear your talk. All right, uh, thanks Vivian. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, get my screen up here. All right, can we see that? Looks good. Great. Um, and I just wanted to uh, just follow up. Uh, Brooke, that was an awesome, awesome talk. And I, I just went, this is sort of a, a pitch, um, but I just went to one of those uh, restored sites just sort of by chance a couple of weeks ago for the first time. And it just botanically is amazing. Like those old kind of riparian corridors, especially the, I went to a restored one. And uh, if uh, for everyone else, if you haven't been to these things, they're just beautiful um, and just a totally different kind of look from a lot of what we see in California. Um, so Brooke, it's great to hear that you're, uh, you're working on that. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for, um, for coming and um, I'm happy to be sharing uh, some work with you today on Dudley's Louse Ward. And uh, the work that I'm doing uh, is a collaboration uh, between myself and uh, Tracy Masewicz from the University of Oakland, or sorry, of Oklahoma, who has done most of the genetic work uh, that I'll be talking about today. Uh, and then also Chris Hauser, um, 
who's very involved in the uh, Monterey CNPS chapter and is an expert on um, the one of the populations that I'll be talking about today. Um, and so the, the kind of place I want to start with, uh, with this is sort of on a lighter note, um, which is when I start talking about this plant with people, usually the first thing that comes up is the name, uh, Dudley's lousewort. It's not the most uh, exotic name. And so, you know, in conservation biology, we're trying to um, always kind of get people excited. And we've had trouble doing that uh, with this plant and in, in part because of its name, it's a beautiful plant. Um, but so I just wanted to start there. And uh, that name, lousewort, uh, is actually rooted in the genus name, which is Pedicularis. Um, and uh, that stems actually from Laos, uh, which uh, derives from this kind of old timey belief from centuries ago that, um, that when livestock would uh, eat um, these Pedicularis, these lousworts, um, that they would break out in, in lice. And so that was kind of a sort of common belief and uh, up you know, through the, the last centuries, uh, including at the time of Linnaeus, who's kind of the father of botanical nomenclature. And, um, and so he named the entire genus um, after this sort of, uh, you know, after the louse. And so we're stuck with uh, this genus and therefore this common name of lousewort. Um, and so the louseworts uh, in general uh, are a very large group. There are about 500 species globally, and most of them are in Asia, um, but they're kind of most common throughout the Northern hemisphere. So kind of cool temperate areas and then extending down into the Andes in the Southern hemisphere. Um, and here in North America, uh, we've got uh, 37 and in California, um, 12. Um, so it's a, it's a big and important group globally, uh, but not so much here in California. We have a pretty small representation. Um, so here's what some of them look like, uh, and um, they're, they're quite, quite charismatic. They're really beautiful. I'm, as Vivian said, I'm used to working on moss, so it's kind of nice to work on a beautiful flower. I like this. And uh, one of the things to notice is that uh, the flowers look a little, uh, just a little odd. You know, they're kind of asymmetric, and they're kind of very interesting. So um, there's actually been a lot of really interesting work on this genus in uh, floral evolution, so the evolution of the shape of the flower. Uh, and the relationship uh, that these plants have with pollinators. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit of our story today, actually, um, talking about Dudley's louse wort. Um, so uh, this particular louse wort uh, was described in 1906, and uh, it's been rare ever since it was discovered. Um, so this uh, yellow text down at the bottom here uh, is from what's called the protologue, which is like the original kind of formal description of the plant. Um, so in, in botany, we have you know, formal rules about naming a species in the correct way and stuff. And um, so this is from that publication in 1906. Um, so I'm just going to uh, read uh, uh, some snippets here. Um, so good flower and fruit of this type specimen, number 4289, um, collected in June 1903 at Iverson's Ranch, um, on the Pescadero Creek, San Mateo County. Um, so you can actually visit uh, this place. This is in Portola Redwood State Park. Here's the, the kind of um, memorial sign. Um, and the, the ranch house, the cabin, was actually uh, still standing until the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and then it fell over. Um, but you can still, still visit that site. Um, and so even from the kind of first thing that we knew about it, we knew that it was, it was quite rare. Um, so it says only known from this locality where it's rare um, and confined to the deep shade of, of coastal redwoods um, and its proximity to a campground endangers um, its existence. Um, and then it was named in honor of Professor uh, Dudley of Stanford University. Um, so right from the get-go, we know um, that it's quite a rare plant, uh, even, even back more than 100 years ago. Um, and uh, this campground, which is if you've ever been to Portola Redwood State Park, um, the campground there is the same campground that's referenced here. And, and still today, the best place to go see this rare plant is just uh, walking around the campground. Um, so uh, to finish up with the, the name, Dudley's lousewort. Um, so this guy, Alfred Elmer, uh, is the one that described the species. And he described it after Dudley. And um, Dudley was a professor at Stanford, um, sort of around the turn of the century, um, the 1800s to 1900s. And um, he was a big kind of big conservationist and a big time botanist at Stanford. And, um, and so Alfred Elmer, who described the species was a graduate student of Dudley's. And so he named it after him. And so apparently he had a, a good time doing his master's work. 
Um, and if, if you're familiar with the stone crops, the genus Dudleya, um, these are named after the same guy, um, William Russell Dudley from Stanford. Um, and in addition to being a botanist, he's also really kind of important to the story of California redwoods um, because he was really instrumental in um, the setting aside of Great Basin State Park, which as I understand it was one of the, the fir very first state parks um, and the first associated with the conservation of the redwood forest, um, the old growth redwood, uh, which was really important uh, back in that era, especially uh, because of all the extensive logging that was happening. So basically most of the Santa Cruz mountains got clear cut between you know, 1850 and the early 1900s. Um, and so the distribution of Dudley's louse wart um, actually extended beyond its um, current range in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is just in Portola Redwood State Park and, and a couple um, adjacent areas. Um, so there's a couple old herbarium specimens from the late 1800s, one from Aptos and one from the San Lorenzo River um, and down in Santa Cruz County. And so what we think happened is that probably it was uh, at least a little bit more common, uh, maybe not much, um, in the past, and then with all the extensive logging in Santa Cruz Mountains, um, it became a much more rare. Um, so nobody really um, did any work with the plant from that initial uh, description uh, of the species until the 1950s. Uh, and at that point, a woman named Elizabeth Sprague um, did her PhD dissertation um, down in Southern California, uh, focused on um, several of the California species of pedicularis, and one of those was, was Dudley's lousewort. And so uh, what she was interested in was the pollination biology and root, parasit root parasitism. Um, so a lot of the, um, the species in the lousewort genus have some degree of root parasitism. Um, it's a kind of important part of their life history. And so that's where a plant actually goes down underground and, and instead of roots, it'll have roots, but it also hooks some of those roots into the roots of other uh, species and, and parasitizes um, uh, them. And um, so a couple of her major findings um, that are relevant to today's talk are that um, she identified two native bumblebees um, as the primary pollinators of the plant. Um, so here's, a, here's an image of, of one of those coming into land. And so these are, these are not like the gigantic bumblebees, you know, um, these are the ones that are, they're like maybe um, one and a half times the size of a honeybee. So kind of modest size. Um, and, and she also was able to demonstrate that, um, that uh, these Dudley's louseworts could persist in cultivation for up to a couple of years uh, without a host, um, which was kind of interesting in the context of, of this genus. Um, and then so from there, that was in the 1950s. And then the next kind of big event in our sort of history of leading up to where we are and what we know today uh, was in the 1970s, late 1970s, uh, people actually found two more populations of this thing, uh, or what would they thought was this thing. Um, so here's Portola redwoods, um, and this is where I've done all my field work. Uh, and then there's a, another population at the Little Sur River in Monterey County. And then there is a third population uh, discovered on the Hearst Ranch uh, in northwestern San Luis Obispo County. And um, that, that third population, the southern population, was uh, a little bit weird morphologically and ecologically. Um, and so the sort of assignment of that population to Dudley's last wart has always been a little bit contentious. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then also around that time in, in the 80s and then moving into the 90s, um, Kim Kuska, uh, who is a naturalist, um, began kind of monitoring the plant, making a lot of um, really important natural history observations and just kind of keeping track of the population, uh, especially at the Little Sur River. Um, and uh, just to give you kind of a, a frame of reference where we are right now, um, as I mentioned, the, the plant's pretty rare. And so the, the total number of reproductive individuals, so flowering individuals, um, this is a long-lived perennial species, uh, is in the range of 1,200 to 1,500. Um, so it's not, not a very common plant. Um, so I mentioned there was issues with that southernmost uh, population. And so just a couple of years ago, Dave Keel down at Cal Poly um, published a paper um, that basically proposed that that southernmost population uh, was actually a distinct species called Pedicularis rigginsiae. Um, so Riggins was a, uh, Rhonda Riggins was a, another botanist at Cal Poly. Um, and um, that kind of makes sense morphologically. It's quite different from Dudley's lost wart uh, and then also ecologically. And so this is the kind of the typical habitat 
for um, Pedicularis regensiae, uh, which is, it's kind of a coastal bluff. So kind of a um, coastal prairie with some like windswept oaks and manzanitas and things like that. Um, so not, not too dissimilar from like what you see out at the coast here in um, over like north of Santa Cruz. Um, and so that habitat really is quite different from the redwood forests um, where these other two populations are. Um, so he proposed that as a different species. Um, and of course that has the result of what making what once was a pretty rare species uh, even more rare because um, now those three populations are split between two species. Um, so that leads up to kind of where, where we um, started, the, my working group. Um, and so the, the general questions that, that we're interested in is first, why is the plant rare? Like what's keeping it rare? Um, how much trouble is it, is it in from a genetic standpoint? And then also what can we learn about the natural history that would help us better manage the species and, and hopefully increase the population size. Um, and this is science. So, so we've got some hypotheses um, that we'll be talking about. And so one of those is that, um, so testing Dave Keel's hypothesis that um, Regan ZA, that Southern San Luis Obispo population is actually a distinct species. So we're gonna test that with genetic data. Um, we're also gonna test whether um, Pedicularis dudleyi, so Dudley's last word, is a single genetic entity with two subpopulations. So that's kind of what it looks like. It's got the Little Sur and the Portola population, but we can test that. Uh, and then we can also test the hypothesis that um, Dudley's louse wart has always been rare. Um, so with genetic data, one of the things you can do uh, if you have the right kind of data is um, you can actually kind of ask questions about the, the nature of the rarity. And so um, for, for some rare plants, you know, they've always been rare. You know, they just have never been common. Uh, whereas other plants uh, maybe became rare very recently. Uh, whereas others maybe you know, were very common at one point, but then, you know, 10 or 20 or 50,000 years ago became rare. Um, and so those all tell us very different things in terms of conservation uh, management uh, um, applications. Um, and so we can test those alternative scenarios and we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll switch to uh, talking about the natural history and, and understanding why the plant continues to be rare and what we can do about it. Um, so we'll test the hypotheses that um, population growth and stability are limited by pollination, uh, or that maybe they're limited by seed production, or maybe by seed dispersal, or maybe by seedling establishment, or perhaps by seedling survival and you know, survival of the plant uh, throughout its growth. And so to just kind of go through the list and what we're doing is we're kind of looking for what the, the weak link in the chain is. And if we can identify that weak link, then that's where we can target our conservation efforts. Um, so this is kind of the genetic background of the species. So here's Pedicularis dudleyi at the bottom of your screen. And um, this figure is a little, what we call phylogeny, which is just an evolutionary tree. So it shows the evolutionary relationships among species. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you kind of the context of where um, the species came from. Uh, so this, um, you can see there's two major groups. So there's a group down, down here, and then there's another group up here. And so keep in mind that Pedicularis is a very large genus with about 500 species all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and we only have about 12 in California. So we're looking at kind of a very small subset of a much larger group of plants. Um, so this, this upper group, um, which is the most close relative of uh, this group that we're interested in down here, is mostly um, from Canada and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and you can see it's all uh, yellow flowered plants. Um, and then um, within this uh, bottom group here, um, you can see the, the first ones that come off, um, Howley and Centrantera and Semi Barbata. Um, these are all from the Western US, so kind of from the Pacific Northwest or the Rockies. Um, and you can see we're starting to get into some different colors. So there's yellows and whites and white and purple. Um, and then the group that we're most interested in is this cluster or what we call a clade uh, evolutionary group um, down here at the bottom, which are all from California. Um, and so this is our um, kind of first result, um, testing Keel's hypothesis that uh, Regan ZA is different. Um, so if they were the same, Regan ZA and Dudley I, what we would expect is that the specimens of Regan ZA would be kind of intermixed in this diagram with those of Dudley I. And we don't see that. We see that there's one cluster of Dudley I and a separate cluster of Regan ZA. So it's very strong evidence that these two are in fact uh, different species from one another. 
Uh, and what's even more interesting is that, um, so this is particular stensiflora. This is a um, common name of Indian warrior or warrior's plume, um, which is a, a very common wildflower that you see all the time when you're hiking in the chaparral or oak woodlands. Um, and so as it turns out, you can see that um, Densiflora and Rigginsiae form a cluster exclusive of Dudley eye. Um, so what we found is that Rigginsiae is actually more closely related to the Indian warrior than it is to Dudley's louse wart. Um, and so that is just even stronger evidence that Rigginsiae and Dudley eye are just two totally different things. Um, so that's pretty cool that we we're able to um, test Dave Keel's hypothesis and, um, and demonstrate that he was in fact um, on, on good solid ground in naming that new species. Um, so that gets us to the fact that there's only two populations of Dudley's louse wart, not three. Um, and so what we're gonna do now is look at the kind of population genetic differences uh, between these two populations. Um, and so we used a sort of a modern genomic approach that I'm not gonna kind of get into the details of it, but the general idea um, is that you take uh, DNA uh, from a bunch of individuals. So we, we used uh, 118 individuals, uh, about evenly split between the two populations. Um, and you use some enzymes that um, randomly cut these things at, at different points. Um, and then you, you match up all the fragments and you can compare across those um, fragments across all the individuals um, to basically share um, you know, similar pieces of DNA across these individuals. Um, and so the, the results that I'm gonna show you are uh, what's called a structure diagram. And so this is not, these are not real data on this slide. I'm just gonna kind of walk you through how the diagram works. Um, and so what you're gonna see is a bunch of bars and each bar represents a single individual. Um, and then what the analysis does is it makes genetic groups um, from these individuals. Um, so in this uh, example here, we've got uh, two different genetic groups, blue and green. And so this individual here on the left um, is assigned to group the blue group. And this individual over here is uh, assigned to the green group. Uh, and then there's a couple individuals here in the middle that are sort of of mixed parentage. So this means they have, um, this one has mostly genes from the blue group and a few genes from the green group, uh, whereas this one is kind of split equally. So this is what like a hybrid would look like, it's sort of half and half from these two genetic groups. Um, so that's how you uh, interpret this kind of a diagram. So now I'll show you the, um, the real data. So again, we've got uh, 118 individuals lined up across here. Um, and so when you split it into two populations, Little Sur versus Portola, uh, what you see is basically no gene flow at all. Um, so these are, these are as genetically distinct as you could possibly uh, expect. Um, but it turns out that that's actually not the optimal, optimal model. So it's not um, sort of mathematically the best way to split these data up into groups. Um, the best way to do that is actually to split them into three groups. And so the, um, you still see the really strong difference between the green versus the blue and pink. Um, but the best model indicates that we actually genetically have three populations, not two. And so Portola is very distinct, but then with, within the little sur population, you actually have two subpopulations. Um, and you can see some, this is sort of just background noise across the bottom here. Um, but if you look at this little blip right here, that's an indication that while you have these two distinct genetic groups within the little sur population, there is some mixing. So there is some gene flow between those two groups. Um, so we'll look at this on a map of the little sur river. Um, so to get you oriented, um, this, is a, this is 500 meters, so a half a kilometer. Uh, and then the stream is flowing from right to left. So the Pacific Ocean is somewhere off to the left. Um, and so we go downstream like this. Um, and these, these little gray dots indicates where we collected the specimens from. And um, here's our structure diagram from the last image. Uh, and then each one of these pie charts is basically just um, giving you the same exact information that we get from the structure diagram. Um, and so there's no green here because this is only little sir, so there's no Portola here. Um, and so these um, pie charts with mostly blue and a tiny sliver of pink um, are going to be, you know, these individuals here. These ones that are mostly blue, pink with a little bit of blue are, are going to be these mixed ones, and then these ones that are mostly pink are, are going to be over here. Um, so what we're seeing. Uh, is that geographically, like along this river, 
there's a pretty pretty good break sort of right somewhere around these two kind of subpopulations. Um, so you get this strong genetic group here and this strong genetic group here, and then individuals from these two populations are a little bit more mixed. Um, and we don't have a, a perfect explanation for what would cause this, because um, you can see this is only a few hundred meters, um, this, this break. So it's kind of interesting that there's such a strong break along this river. Um, but the, the most sort of simple explanation is that uh, at some point back in time, you had two populations that were sort of completely separate uh, from one another for some amount of time. Um, and then just recently, for some reason, they've come back in contact and have started to exchange um, either pollen or, or seeds. Um, so basically exchange DNA a little bit, and that's what we're seeing um, here um, is, uh, is our sort of standing hypothesis for what might explain this kind of a pattern. Um, and so this, this all has um, implications for um, management in terms of like what you do with seeds. Um, so these are rare plants, and so we're very interested in you know, getting these populations up and going again. Um, and so, you know, what this is telling us is we definitely don't want to be mixing seed, for example, between Portola and Little Sur. Um, and then probably we don't even really maybe want to be um, mixing seed, or at least we should have a, a really real kind of thorough discussion about mixing seed between these upstream and downstream populations at Little Sur. Um, and then just to, to kind of show this in a more, more numerical way, um, these are uh, just some kind of summary statistics about the population genetics. Um, so private alleles are um, alleles, and so alleles are gene copies. And so these are like, um, you know, if you, ha you have some gene and you have one copy from mom and you have another copy from dad, so those different copies of the different alleles. And um, so these are the number of alleles that are um, in one of these populations, but not the other. Um, and the point here is that these numbers are, are quite large. So a very large proportion of the alleles are not shared across these populations. Um, so this again just means that these, these populations, all three of them are, are quite distinct from each other and especially Portola from Little Sur. Um, and then there's some, some other kind of measures of genetic diversity. Um, and so the general takeaway is that genetic diversity is, is very, very low. Um, so we have one measure called polymorphic loci, uh, which is defined here. So that's just the percentage of these DNA fragments that we use um, at which there are multiple alleles. So, you know, multiple different copies within that population. Um, and um, so these numbers are, are quite low and you can see um, it's much lower at Portola than it is at Little Sur. Um, so this is in the twenties and these are both in the forties. So this is saying that the genetic diversity of at Portola is much lower than it is down at Little Sur. Um, and then there's another measure of um, heterozygosity, um, which is the, like the proportion of individuals that have two different alleles versus two of the same alleles. And that's just another measure of genetic diversity. And the important thing here is that, um, so if genetic diversity is really high, this number will be close to one. If genetic diversity is super low, this number will be close to zero. And you can see 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.04. These numbers are much closer to zero than they are to one. Uh, which is an indication that genetic diversity in all these populations is very, very low, um, which is not unexpected for a, a plant with population sizes of, of, you know, in the kind of 1,000 to 1,500 range. Um, and then our kind of last genetic result uh, is we did something called demographic modeling. Um, and so in this, we're, we're basically getting at this idea that um, we don't really know why these plants are rare, but we can kind of propose some different scenarios um, and then we can build models um, that approximate what would happen in those scenarios. And then we can compare the real data to each one of these models and see which model fits the data best. Um, and, um, and then you know, choose based on some, um, some kind of quantitative criteria, which model fits the data best. Um, and so the three that we're gonna examine are, um, the first one is a stable population size through time. And so these have a very small population right now and again, it's, it's possible that they've just always been rare since they originated. Um, that would be very different from something where there was a recent bottleneck. So that would be a case like logging where they were common at one point in time and then just very, very recently. So we're talking in like uh, the time scale of, of species. So, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Um, so a recent bottleneck would be in the last few centuries. 
um, versus an ancient bottleneck. So something maybe that happened 10, 20, 50, 100,000 years ago, um, where it's common before then, but then maybe, you know, the climate changed, you know, 50,000 years ago, and, and now it's rare. Um, so we can basically look at each one of these three different scenarios and compare them to the data that we actually have to see which is the best model. Um, so this is what these look like uh, visually. So moving through time going down. Um, so at some point there was some um, ancestral population um, and then that split into, and then there was a Portola population and a Little Sur population. And then at some point later in time, the Little Sur, ancestral Little Sur population split into the two Little Sur populations. Um, so in scenario one, uh, the population sizes basically stayed about the same throughout that time period. Um, and again, we don't know exactly how long that was, but we're just going back thousands of years. Um, and then in scenario two, we have a recent genetic bottleneck. So that, again, this is our like logging type scenario. And then in scenario three, we have, this is sort of like an ancient climate change type of a scenario. Um, so we know, for example, that a lot of the coastal plant communities in California used to be more widespread, you know, like the coastal close cone coniferous forests, um, the redwood forests, things like that used to be more common um, 10, 20,000 years ago. And um, so we can, we can see which one of these models works best. And um, the, the results are that the, the second scenario with the very recent bottleneck is far and away the best fit to the, the genetic data that we have. Um, and so the way that we measure this is with something called a, a posterior probability. And you can just think about this as like sort of the percent chance that this model is right as opposed to the other two models. And here we've got a 97 out of 100. So it's a very sort of confident estimate that uh, if, if it's one of those three scenarios that we propose, then it's gonna be this scenario. Um, and of course it could be some other scenario that we didn't use, um, but out of these three, which I think are all pretty reasonable, um, the data conform to this one. Um, so that's it for the genetic data. If you're not into genetics, we're, we're done with that part. Um, but some really interesting results, I think. Um, so I'll just kind of recap those here and then we'll kind of move into the natural history stuff. Um, and so first result is that there's definitely two uh, geographic populations, Portola and Little Sur of Dudley's Lousewort. And Reginzie, that San Luis Obispo County thing is definitely different. Um, the two populations uh, are very, so Little Sur and Portola are very different from one another genetically, and both have really low genetic diversity. Um, Portola has actually more individuals, but it has lower genetic diversity, which is, again, is interesting from kind of a management perspective. Um, and the Little Sur population is made up of two very, very distinct genetic subpopulations, which again, has some pretty interesting management implications. Um, and low population sizes today are likely caused by a recent decrease in population size. And again, that's um, completely um, consistent. It doesn't prove anything, but it's completely consistent with the idea that um, these things took a big hit in the last couple of centuries, which is very consistent with um, the extensive logging that took place throughout redwood forests. Um, <clears throat> so moving into the kind of natural history of like what, um, so we know kind of why these things became rare a little bit, but now let's talk about why they remain rare and maybe how we can make them more common. Um, and so we're gonna go through these um, different uh, aspects of the life history to see whether any of these are these kind of weak links in the chain of uh, having a stable, healthy population. Um, so we'll start with uh, pollinators. So we asked whether uh, pollinators are even necessary. Um, and so in, um, we, we do this with, uh, these are called um, um, just uh, pollinator exclosures, and it's just a mesh bag. Um, and since we're dealing with really big pollinators, these bumblebees, um, it's pretty simple. We just got a twisty here and a mesh bag to keep out the bees. And so, um, you know, we bag some of these inflorescences, um, and then we look at what happens inside those bags um, that keep the pollinators out. Um, so the kind of the background rate of fruit maturation, so when so flowers after they get pollinated turn into fruits. And so um, usually they don't all make it. Um, so maybe they don't all get pollinated. Um, and so the natural rate you can see is about 0.8. So about 80% of flowers produce fruits in um, the control. So just the on a typical inflorescence. 
Um, and then when you put these bags on, uh, the number of fruits that mature goes down to zero. Um, so we can see that basically the, the plants uh, really need those bees. And so if the bees aren't around, they're not gonna make fruits. Um, so that's a sort of first important point. Uh, and the second is that um, if you actually take the bag off and then hand pollinate those flowers and then put the bag back on uh, with pollen from the same exact plant, uh, you recover about half of the, the fruit set. Um, so basically, and, and we don't know if those seeds are viable, uh, but we know at least that the plant can make seeds. And so um, that's really important because a lot of these individuals in these populations are fairly widely scattered. Um, and so even with a strong flyer like a bumblebee, they might not be able to cross pollinate. And so knowing the extent to which they can self pollinate is, is important information for management. Um, so in other words, to kind of boil this down, the seed set seems fine, like there's no kind of red flags in, in this information. Um, and, um, and then also that the um, selfing does work, but at a lower rate than um, the outcrossing. Um, so again, there, there's two native bumblebees are the kind of the main pollinators of these. There are um, honeybees around in these populations, but primarily they get pollinated by these two native bees in the genus Bombus, so Bombus sicensis and Bombus melanopigus. Um, and these are actually the same two bees that Elizabeth Sprague identified back in the 1950s. Um, so it seems that um, nothing much has happened there, which is good. Um, and to give you a sense for how much pollinating they're doing, because um, again, these flowers rely completely on these, these pollinators. Um, in this graph, uh, the, the y-axis here is the number of flowers on a typical visit. So you have a big patch of, of these Dudley's louseworts and the bees will come in and they'll visit multiple flowers. Um, so this tells you the number of individual flowers that each one, one of these two uh, bee species is visiting on a typical bout. Um, so on average, about 20 flowers and, and one species visits a few more than the others, but you know, around 20. And probably what's more important is how many different plants the different bees visit. Um, because uh, again, it's, it's important to be like cross pollinating between plants. And so on a typical bout, again, um, between five and 10 different plants, a bee will visit. Um, so that's really encouraging. So we know that the plants really need these pollinators, but we also see that the pollinators are showing up and doing what they do. And um, so it doesn't appear that pollination has anything to do with why these plants are rare. They appear to be um, this appears to be uh, very healthy. Uh, this is just a little uh, image of um, how we make these recordings. Um, so we just set up the remote cameras and uh, watch as the bees kind of come in and, and we can uh, um, then score those videos after that. Um, so if it's not pollination, maybe it's something else. Um, and so the next thing we looked at is seed dispersal. Um, so Kim Kuska, the naturalist that I mentioned, who's done a lot of work with Dudley's Lousewort, um, had some ideas about maybe the things that might disperse uh, the seeds. So he proposed uh, banana slugs. So you can see this banana slug kind of sliming over the top of a flowering stock, um, or potentially deer, uh, or maybe native ants uh, in the genus Formica, um, or possibly yellow jackets. Um, and so we went through um, kind of all these to, to look at um, which one of these seemed the most reasonable. Um, and so we were able to uh, rule out the banana slugs uh, pretty quickly. Um, so they're very active when the flowering stalks are out. They really like eating the, the dead withered corollas. Um, so the corollas, the, the flowers uh, mature from top to bottom. So these are the youngest flowers and then down at the base. Um, so they go from white to purple to brown. And once they turn brown, the banana slugs just eat them up like crazy. Um, but once it sort of dries out into midsummer when the seeds are ready, the banana slugs are kind of nowhere to be found. Um, and then there's also problems with how they would actually move them. Um, you know, it doesn't seem that plausible that, you know, the seeds would be able to make it through a digestive tract of the, of the slug. Um, ants um, are sort of always around and actively foraging on the plants, um, but we really didn't observe any actually going and interacting with the fruits in any way once the seeds were mature. So we ruled that out. Uh, and then the deer, uh, very clearly eat the flowering stalks, um, but it's primarily before the fruits are mature, and so the seeds wouldn't be ready yet, and so that doesn't seem very plausible. And then also, um, 
you know, if you've seen a deer's teeth, um, you know, it's probably just not a, a good way to, to get around going through the digestive tract of a deer, um, especially if it's, you know, chewing its cud and then, um, you know, vegetation is sort of going up and down and getting chewed multiple times. Um, but what we did find uh, was that yellow jackets, of all things, are actually really common visitors of these fruits. Um, so here's a yellow jacket kind of actually crawling into the mature capsule. Um, so you, these little green things are uh, bracts, so they're modified leaves associated with the flowers and fruit. And these little brown things, this is a, a like a cracked open seed pod right here. Uh, and there's another one right here. And then this wasp is sort of like entering uh, into one as well. Um, so we recorded them visiting uh, just under one fruit an hour or one inflorescent stalk an hour. Uh, and on about half of these visits, they actually grabbed a seed and flew off with it. Um, so they'll take these seeds and, um, and just take off at, at a pretty good rate. And so this is not, you know, uh, a huge number, uh, but you multiply that by the number of inflorescences and the number of, you know, yellow jackets and the amount of time during the seed season. Um, and it accounts for potentially quite a lot of dispersal. Um, and one of the, the interesting things that got us thinking about this is um, so that you can see these, this uh, it, seed pod is, is kind of like popped open and then you can see the little seeds in there. There's usually four seeds to a pod. Um, and each seed is about the size of uh, like a short grain rice grain. Um, and so what we noticed is that the, um, so when the, the seed pods pop open, they don't always pop open all the way. You know, it's kind of like those really irritating um, pistachios, you know, like the nice ones that pop all the way open. Um, but then there's those, those ones that just kind of just crack open, but you can't crack them open the rest of the way. So these seed pods kind of do that. Um, and then when you look in the ones that are fully open, um, the seeds in there have the outer seed coat kind of scraped away. Uh, whereas when you look at the fruits that didn't pop open all the way, um, the seeds are completely intact. Um, and that's what this, this graph is, is showing. Um, and uh, what the seeds look like are this. So these are normal seeds over here. Uh, and then uh, the ones that have been visited by the wasps, or the, so the open ones, um, have that this kind of outer surface, kind of a spongy looking surface um, that gets chipped away, uh, presumably by the wasps. And um, so uh, yellow jackets, um, have been um, sort of recently recognized as, as potentially um, potentially important seed dispersers in other California native plants. Um, and so uh, wasps are, are often out there, or at least yellow jackets, um, looking for either uh, sugars or proteins or lipids. Um, they're kind of generalists, um, which is probably why they like our picnics. You know, you have all those things. Um, but uh, a lot of um, plants actually make, you know, attractive um, sort of little appendages or organs or things um, that, that will attract the wasps so that the wasps will then pick up the seeds and, and fly away with them. And um, so we haven't tested this yet, but we think that that's the sort of purpose of this kind of spongy looking coat on the outside, but that's um, future work to be determined. Um, but I think it's pretty compelling evidence that these wasps are definitely coming in, searching for this, and they're definitely taking these seeds off and, and potentially an important vector for moving um, the seeds of Dudley's louse ward around. Um, so this is a picture of, um, uh, from a recent paper um, on this topic. Uh, this is Calicanthus uh, spicebush, which is a native California shrub. Um, and so there's a, a recent paper talking about yellow jacket dispersal of seeds in that California native as well. Um, so we've gone through pollination and seed dispersal. Um, and so now let's talk about seed germination and establishment. Um, so these are what the, the little cotyledons look like. And then here's the first, like the primary leaves growing up. Um, so we attempted to uh, germinate uh, a bunch of seeds in the greenhouse and completely failed. Um, and, uh, and then looking out in the field, uh, but so by failed, I mean, um, we tried and tried and couldn't get any of them to germinate at all. Uh, and then out in the field, it looks like around, and these are kind of back of the envelope calculations, but around 5% of seeds germinate um, under field conditions. Um, so not, not super high. Um, and then these two together definitely suggest that, um, you know, unlike the seed dispersal and pollination, you know, there may be a, a kind of sticking point in the gears of, of the natural history of this plant around establishment. 
Uh, and uh, one of the, the potential problems is the heavy litter buildup, um, with, uh, which is caused by fire suppression. Um, and so um, one of the things that the people have noticed anecdotally uh, is that you tend not to see Dudley's louseware in areas that have a lot of litter buildup. Um, and so we've done some litter exclusion trials to see if that promotes seedling establishment. Um, but so far, those have been inconclusive. Um, but we do think that um, removing litter may be an effective way of, um, of getting more seedlings to, to germinate and establish uh, in the field. And we're, we're pursuing that right now. Um, and then once they get established, then they have to you know, make it to reproductive maturity. Um, so here's a big uh, mature plant. So this is maybe um, 14 or 16 inches across. And then you can see these small individuals. This is actually slightly downhill. You can't really tell from the photo, um, but basically these seeds have probably kind of just rolled downhill a few inches and have established you know, young individuals um, just outside of the kind of uh, reach of the mother plant. Um, so we've done a, a complete census and um, broken down by age class. And so um, this graph right here is just showing the distribution uh, across the five uh, sort of patches uh, within Portola that have the most individuals um, and broken down by age class. So the important thing to, to look at here is the top bar, which are the number of flowering individuals in a patch versus the bottom bar, which is the number of that year's seedlings. Um, and what you can notice is, uh, is like the ratio of the top bar to the, the bottom bar is quite different across these different patches. And so it's hard to really get a good estimate of, you know, the progression of basically how many, so how many seedlings die before they become young plants, how many young plants die before they become mature plants and how many mature plants die before they go on to reproductive maturity. Um, and to really get a sense for, um, you know, how these plants are doing and, and what the weak links are in their life history once they get established, um, we really need to get those numbers. And, and we've just been monitoring this way for a couple of seasons. Um, and so it'll take a good five or 10 years worth of data collection before we can kind of come up with uh, reasonable numbers for these. Uh, what we do know is that the, um, uh, there's been some outplantings. So that's where we actually know the age of these plants in both 2011 and 2015 um, by Kim Kuska, that naturalist. Um, and from just kind of anecdotal observations from those, it's, it's pretty clear that age to first reproduction is probably around five years. Um, so these aren't big plants, um, but they basically have a big, a big root um, and it takes them a while to get going. Um, and, uh, and then we don't also know how long they live, um, but from some of the long-term monitor monitoring data that um, Kim Kuska has done, it appears that uh, probably it's in on scale of decades. Um, so again, they have these big roots and they just kind of produce leaves every year. Um, and some years they produce flowers and, and others not. Um, so we ha still have a lot to learn uh, on that front. Um, but to summarize um, what we know about the natural history, um, and we're sort of heading towards wrapping this up now, uh, is that pollination does not appear to be a problem. Uh, seed production does not appear to be a problem. Seed dispersal does not appear to be a problem. Uh, seedling germination or establishment um, definitely seems to be a problem and something that we can work on from a conservation perspective. Um, and then seedling survival and persistence like through the life stages doesn't seem to be a problem, but we just really don't have enough data to say anything um, about that in a, a real informative way. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there's these outplantings in 2011 and 2015 um, that had some success. There was a lot of die-off in those, but some of those individuals are still alive today and still reproducing. Um, so that's one of the, the areas that's also tied to number four here, which we've identified as a weak link. Um, so that's one of the big um, areas that, that we're working on to hopefully improve the kind of status of this plant is by starting new populations that are in the proximity of other populations, you know, close enough that bees can, um, can intermix with them. Um, so to kind of put all the sort of ideas together from this talk, um, so again, this plant is, is pretty rare in the grand scheme of things. Um, so definitely fewer than 1,500 reproductive individuals uh, across both the two populations. Um, these two populations, Little Sur and Portola, are genetically uh, very, very distinct from one another. Um, and so in terms of recovering these populations, we, you know, we probably don't want to be mixing um, seed. 
um, genetic patterns are consistent with a recent decline. Uh, and again, there's a sort of smoking gun of all the logging uh, and establishment of new populations appears to be the current limiting factor. Unfortunately, that's something that from a manage per management perspective, we can actually um, work on. Um, so what we're doing, um, and I'm, I'll tell you who I'm partnering with in uh, the acknowledgement slide, is uh, understanding uh, the stability of population, so how these age class uh, age classes are balanced, um, outplanting new populations because um, it appears to work, um, and then also understanding whether litter removal will work to um, kind of improve the recruitment within existing populations. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, again acknowledge the the two um, sort of um, collaborators that are they're deeply involved in this project and and on this talk. Uh, which for Chris Hauser um, from Monterey County, uh, who's an expert in the Little Sur population, and then also uh, Tracy Masewich, who's the geneticist who's done all that work I told you about. Um, and then our, our kind of main collaborator collaborators um, for the three of us are uh, Mushtaba from Portola and Castle Rock Foundation, which is a nonprofit um, that kind of promotes um, sort of conservation and, and awareness and accessibility and stuff in Portola and Castle Rock State Parks. Um, and then Amy from, who's the CNPS rare plants botanist. Um, and she also lives up in the Santa Cruz mountains. So she's taking a very strong interest in this plant. Uh, and then Ryan Diller from California State Parks, who's our main uh, biologist that we work with out of the parks. Um, and we got money to work on this project. Um, the molecular work is pretty expensive, and we got that from the Save the Redwoods League, um, which we're very grateful. And then the National Science Foundation paid for some of Tracy's uh, time. Um, and like any university project, we had a lot of undergraduates involved. Um, so Austin and Anjum and Tracy, and Austin is now in uh, grad school at UCLA, and Anjum is in grad school at San Francisco State, um, both doing uh, sort of plant ecology related work, uh, which we're very excited about. And then Tracy's still in the lab. Um, and then just a couple other people, uh, Dave Keel down at Cal Poly uh, has been really helpful in talking about um, our project with us. Um, Kim Kuska, the naturalist has given us a lot of ideas to work with. Uh, Lydia Smith um, at UC Berkeley uh, has helped us with genetic work. Uh, and then Tim Hyland is another parks biologist. And then last, and this is really, I think a cool story about um, the importance of just getting out and talking with people about plants. Um, so this last person, Tyler Knapp, is a, a ranger, like, and not like a um, botanist, but like a, a ranger with a gun and a badge and stuff. And he's the one that actually got this whole project started. And the way that it started is um, I give a, a tour uh, every semester um, to a tour of my herbarium at San Jose State. Um, to an art history class. Uh, and in that art, art history class, uh, a woman pulled me aside one day after the herbarium tour and said, my husband is a park ranger uh, who's really interested in this super rare plant and you guys should talk about it. Um, and so the whole project kind of developed out of that. It's a really coincid coincidental meeting um, that came from just an herbarium tour to an art class. And so I think that's a nice sort of reminder of like all the positive things that can happen if we just talk to people uh, who may not be thinking about plants, talking about plants and, and you know, start some, some interesting dialogues out there. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in this local plant and this local project, um, feel free to email me. Uh, and as Vivian said, uh, I'm very much involved in the CMPS Bryophyte chapter. Um, and so um, next to CMPS website, you just kind of go over to our page and, and check things out. Uh, I think we're planning on doing a, a sort of collaborative field work uh, with the Santa Clara chapter with you guys, uh, hopefully this winter sometime, uh, if you're interested in going for a moss walk. Um, so uh, please keep us in mind. And um, thanks. So if there's questions, I can take those now. Thanks, Ben. That was terrific and very comprehensive. And I, it's just wonderful to hear so much about uh, this rare plant that's in our chapter area that I think a lot of our chapter members may never have heard of or, or definitely haven't seen, myself included. And I've been here for a little while. So hopefully one day we can also maybe have a walk out there. Well, what is the optimum blooming season, by the way? Uh, it's sort of um, like it's definitely on the later side. So um, like mid-May. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the best place to, to see it um, really is if 
if you just go to um, Portola Redwoods uh, State Park, um, just to the, there's a very nice little visitor center. Um, and there's a little, it's like a three space parking lot to uh, where you can, um, you know, like pay your entrance fee at the visitor center. Um, and so if you're just standing in the parking lot facing the visitor center, there's a little kind of fenced off natural area to your left. So, you mm -hmm. know, like five or 10 feet from the visitor center. Um, and there's five or six individuals in there. Um, and so that's the sort of easiest, most easy access to. Uh, very, very easy. So was field work um, affected last year from the, uh, from the shutdown of the state parks, especially in that area? And then we had the sh also the shutdown from the um, CZU fire. Yeah, it really was. And unfortunately, most of our field work was the preceding um, season, but um, they, there was like limited access for, um, for people with ongoing research projects. Um, so we were able to head out for a few days in there to kind of maintain some of the, some of the um, momentum. Good. So um, some question about gene flow, which you got into. The, the gene flow in the Little Sur population seems to be unidirectional and downstream in the direction of stream flow. Might this be due to water dispersal of seeds? Totally. Yeah, so that's a great observation. And um, we can't really prove it. The kind of methods that, that we're using, um, uh, it definitely suggests that, but um, you know, we, we can't really separate with what we're doing. Sometimes you can separate this kind of thing out with um, the sort of pollen movement versus seed movement in plants. Um, and we can't do that here, but um, it certainly is suspicious and, and it would make sense. These are pretty big seeds. Um, and they, the, um, especially at the little sort of population. So basically where they live there is kind of in the, um, you know, like along, so imagine in sort of like, um, Big, like Big Sur, you know, the creeks in that area. Um, so you, mm -hmm. like steep canyons, and then um, there's a, a river with boulders and stuff. And then um, there they, they live in kind of like not right on the stream bank, but in that like that shelf that's like maybe in the 50 or 100 year floodplain kind of thing. Um, so, you know, like those shelves that'll be like maybe like five feet above the kind of regular maximum water line. Um, and so definitely kind of in that range where they could be getting washed downstream. Um, and I think that the um, person who commented is, is, I mean, we can't prove it, but it, I'm pretty sure they're right, that that's probably what's happening. Right. And so follow up on that sort of the lack of gene flow and genetic distinctness, may the Portola and Little Sur populations be considered subspecies or varieties, or that's still to be determined? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's another super good question. And um, the, it's something that definitely we're we're talking about and, and different people feel differently about um, describing new taxa that you can't tell apart with your eyes. Um, and um, uh, well, yeah, so it's, it's an area of active discussion. Um, you know, I think that it, because uh, there's an argument for describing these things um, in that, um, you know, we can't basically go out and seek um, uh, protection. Um, so this is a state listed plant, but not a federally listed plant. Um, and uh, it's just listed as rare, not as endangered. Um, but you can't, you know, you can't really federally or, or even at the state level protect something unless it has a name. Um, so there's that kind of argument for naming it. Um, and, uh, but then there's also, you know, pushback from some sectors in that, like, if there's absolutely no way to identify something other than with a DNA sequencer, um, like, is that a useful thing to name? Um, and I, I tend to sort of um, err on the side of naming things so that we can recognize them and, and protect them. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it's a kind of evolving conversation about, um, you know, what the, um, you know, what the best strategy is in terms of um, for the people managing the plant um, right. and what's going to help them to get the tools that they need. And though um, one of those in San Luis Obispo County, the uh, the one that was named mm -hmm. the Oreo de la whatever yeah. was, the Laos yeah, wort, yeah. and that one is also just a one B two like the Laos wort, so it doesn't have the state listing either yet mm -hmm. for that one, right? As far as I know, yeah, I may be in the pipeline. I'm not sure. Okay, um, yeah, this is very interesting. So, are the the Portola and Little Sir plants parasitizing different plant species? Uh, so that we don't know. That's a super interesting question. Um, the uh, the only way you can tell is to dig them up. Um, and so with a really rare plant like this, um, 
we don't want to dig too many up. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> um, there, there is, there is actually, there's an alternative though. You can, um, and we may be pursuing this in the future, but what you could do is like, you could take a, like in a greenhouse, you know, grow up a bunch of little baby, you know, redwoods and dug firs and the drones and tan oaks, and then plant seeds of, of Dudley's lousewort in each one of those pots to, you know, determine which host they prefer. Um, so you could actually do it. It would take 20 years in the greenhouse, but it could certainly be done. Um, and the short answer is we, we really don't, um, don't know. And the, uh, the vegetation is fairly similar um, mm -hmm. in terms of at least the dominant species at the two sites, Portola and Little Sur. Um, and so uh, it would be a little surprising to me, um, but there's been a lot of surprising things about this plant. Um, so <laughs> the more you know. So yeah. did you mention what the typical host plants are for the Dudley I? We don't know. So um, I, I did get permission to dig up one um, as a part of this project to make an herbarium specimen to vouch for the study. Um, and that one was uh, connected to a redwood. Um, but, um, you know, that's one. And so we don't, you know, um, we just don't know. It's so interesting that the Indian, the uh, warrior's plume is so common and this one is so rare. And I think the, uh, yeah, the warrior's plume parasitizes a number of different plants in the chaparral and woodlands. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like, that's exactly the kind of thing. Um, so, and it's interesting, right? Because you have two super rare plants, um, the Dudley's lousewort and then the Arroyo de la Cruz lousewort uh, related to the super common thing. Um, and it could absolutely be that, you know, these things are restricted by their host plants. Um, another kind of obvious difference between among, among these three is that um, both the, uh, this one, the Dudleys, and then also the one down in San Luis Obispo have the kind of like classic white and purple bumblebee pollinated mm -hmm. um, kind of flower, whereas the warrior's plume, um, the, it's got that bright red flower and the stamens are actually kind of different and it's barely clearly a hummingbird, um, plant. And so something like that could make a difference as well. Um, mm. and yeah, and until you actually like dig into these things, it's, it's pretty tough to know. And, uh, it, that's one of the challenges with conservation biology is that, um, you know, doing experiments and stuff is a little trickier because, um, you know, you don't want to chop up the plants and, uh, sure. which is what you would, would you'd need to do to get the answers to these things. Lessen the damage. So um, your yellow jacket slide, and you mentioned from that other paper, where uh, got a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. I had never known that yellow jackets could carry away something like that. Okay, like was carrying away a giant <laughs> seed. But yeah. Oh, do, they, do yellow jackets frequently eat seeds or fruit like that? Is that a common thing or? Uh, so the, um, so one of those papers that I referenced um, kind of did a nice little uh, review of, of the recent literature and there's very, there's not very much on it, but uh, you know, I think it, it's one of these things where um, uh, like in, in science, we have this uh, analogy where like, or sort of phrase or whatever that, um, you know, like if you're in a parking lot at night uh, and you lose your keys, you know, the place that you look for your keys is under the lights, right? Right, and right. That has nothing to do with where your keys are, but right. that's where, you, you know, so, um, and I think that that sort of logic applies here is that, you know, maybe people just haven't really been thinking about yellow jackets being important. So nobody's bothered to look. Mm -hmm. um, and that definitely seems from, from not my work, but the um, uh, Dylan Burge is the, the guy who's done um, some of this mm -hmm. other work um, summarizing these things. And, um, you know, it definitely feels like one of these things that it may not be that rare. Um, it just could be that nobody's thinking about it. Um, yeah, really looked at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, follow up on the yellow jackets, a lot of in park campgrounds, such as the one near, you're talking about the visitor center, maintenance crews will put up yellow jacket traps around picnic tables and so forth. So they don't bother people. Is it the same kind of yellow, jack yellow jackets that would be your wasp that would be doing this? And uh, mm -hmm. might they be these maintenance practices be limiting seed dispersal? You know, that's a, that's a really interesting point. It's not something we've thought about, um, but it certainly, it certainly could be. And, um, you know, I get the impression from that, at least that area that um, like 
the yellow jackets are definitely like winning the war against the maintenance crews, you know? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I think they're going to be okay, but, um, but it is really an interesting point because, um, you know, we haven't thought about that in terms of, um, you know, limiting factor, but, uh, we certainly should be. And, um, the main, um, the biggest, fortunately, the biggest populations of these, there's a couple of like really big patches are, um, are quite distant actually from the campground. Um, like the, the biggest one in the park is actually along the entrance road. You know, there's a, that kind of fairly long entrance road mm -hmm. once you start in the park to, to get to the visitor center. Right. Um, so it's along that road. Um, and um, so, and, and there are tons of yellow jackets there and um, you know, there's not really any, you know, people don't really go around there because um, there's no trails and people don't walk the road. So um, sure. the yellow jacket population appears to be pretty healthy just kind of around there. I, tr I trust their population more these I'm worried about these two little bumblebees though that's <laughs> yeah. more spe specialized so um a couple more if you have time yeah, yeah of course. uh so how do host plants figure into plant rarity for the louse ward and could the vigor of the host plants be influencing population size and resilience after disturbances like logging and fire and I will add drought mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and and again it's just a really tricky thing um to, to measure, um, you know, because it's underground and, and we can't see it, but, um, you know, like with any kind of parasitism, right, the host health and vigor is going to be super important to the parasite. And, um, it's not, it's not something that we've thought sort of deeply about, um, you know, perhaps we should be, but the, um, cause most of the, I mean, the species that are in common across like all the little, cause it's a kind of fragmented population across Portola. There's about 20 little patches spread around. Um, and then similar down at, at Little Sur. Uh, but the, you know, if you look at the species that are in the, the other plant species, the potential host species that are in common across all these sites, it's gotta be one of the, like the five most common things, um, you know, sort of Madrone, Tan Oak, mm -hmm. uh, Huckleberry, um, dug for, you know, one of these common, because that's the only thing that would occur around all the, the sites where these things are, are healthy. Um, and, you know, and I think those, um, none of those plants seem to be, uh, doing very poorly. Um, mm -hmm. you know, could like sudden oak death might certainly be a concern. Um, you know, if it was, for example, if it's on tan oak, um, and, sure. um, but yeah, it's, it's a great question and it's just a really hard nut to crack because, uh, you know, until we can figure out a way to study these underground relationships, um, we're, we're kind of tied. Sure. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of invasive species in those, uh, those areas as well. It seems like they're pretty, pretty basic kind of forests that I was wondering about invasive species, but it doesn't seem like that's a big issue. And, yeah, that's no, that's a really good observation that um, a lot of times, right, that's like rarity is pretty easy to explain because there's just competition from an invader. And um, but you're absolutely right in that um, these communities, you know, there'd be a couple weeds around, but um, uh, certainly not enough to be kind of out competing. And, and then if you actually look at the, you know, the plants that are actually sort of within the kind of root zone of, of Dudley's last ward, they would be, you know, competing for nutrients or competing for light. Um, it's all pretty much natives um, and, and not even particularly vigorous natives. Um, so the, the plants that you see this the, the most with are, um, like out in the Redwoods forest, there's uh, viola or, um, I can't remember the common name, but the, the little white violet with the purple spots on the back is one of the Two really spot common. violet maybe? Yeah. yeah, thank you. And then and there's also a little white calicordis um, uh, calicardus, the pussy, pussy calicardus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Sorry, my uh, names are just not with me tonight. <laughs> um, uh, and then also the um, that woodland star, the Lismachia, um, right. is is another common associate. So the, like those kind of places where um, you know, I think the the shades deep enough um, that you know a lot of those invasive species tend to prefer the sun. Yes. Um, um, so we have one more question about mycorrhizal fungi for germination, um, like orchids need mycorrhizal fungi. And I guess that might also involve more digging up the roots, I imagine. 
Yeah, and I was actually, uh, we were trying to get at that. It's another like really astute question. Um, we we're trying to get that at that with that uh, greenhouse germination study that we were doing, um, where we just totally failed and nothing germinated. But we actually had a, a treatment where, um, in one, we sterilized, steam sterilized the soil and then the soil from the site. Uh, and in another treatment, uh, we didn't sterilize it. So it should have left all those um, organisms intact. Um, and so we were hoping to actually test that, but um, like until we can get these things to germinate, um, which we're just not sure what the cues are. Um, but that that is something we can actually study in the greenhouse by doing these, you know, sterilized versus non-sterilized treatments mm -hmm. um, at some point in the future. Great. I think I think that's it. Unless Vivian or Gladys, you have anything else that you wanted to that I overlooked? Okay. Uh, no, I think that's it. Gladys actually uh, lost her connection, so I've been. Oh. monitoring YouTube the last little <laughs> Me bit. Me too. And we're looking forward to uh, having a talk, I mean, a walk with you. Uh, hopefully it'll be a nice, wet, rainy season we have coming up this year. We can see lots of bryophytes. Um, that'll be wonderful. So, um, and and also I wanted to add that I would love if we could arrange a tour of the herbarium as well, the Sharsmith Herbarium at San Jose State. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in I, touch about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're, um, as you might expect, things with uh, COVID have been a little tight, but, um, and depending on sort of what the Delta does, um, things are definitely kind of opening up this fall. And then hopefully by this spring, uh, it should be a little better. Um, but we would love to have you. And, uh, I think that'd be super fun. Thanks very much, Ben. We really appreciate it. Vivian. All right. Yeah. I, my thanks as well. That was a great presentation. Learned a lot. Um, great. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I really, uh, it's, it's fun to talk about this, these local projects. Okay, folks. Well, I guess that wraps it up for tonight. Uh, we'll be back again at the beginning of August with another talk. So uh, looking forward to more talks. And thank you again, Ben. That was that was just a wonderful talk. And Great. I'm Thanks, going everyone. to be uh, ending our session now. So good night, everybody.